Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 23rd of July, 2020. I'm going to kick off this show with a big thanks to our Patreon supporters helping to make these shows possible. This week's top tier support includes Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, James Marchington, the guys at South Esher Stalking, Josh Starling, Sean Rowan, Thomas Cameron and Mark Zabrowski. If you want to support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash Pace Brothers, where you can check out all of the tiers and the swag that we give away. You can pledge as little as a dollar a month, and every dollar makes a massive difference. To our competition, which we run every two weeks, and a chance to win a copy of Modern Huntsman. On the last show, I asked you to tag me somewhere uh, with your favorite episode on social or send me an email. And the winner I picked uh, was from Twitter, uh, Dazzler at Yorks underscore Exile, who mentioned the show with Dr. Amy Dickman in a Twitter storm all around trophy hunting. So congratulations, Dazzler. You are the winner. Shoot me an email, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. The publication Modern Huntsman are our partners on this podcast, and you can check out some of the back episodes of this show. Uh, Look for the ones with Tyler Sharp in particular, or you can head over to modernhuntsman.com to read a little bit more about it. Volume 5 is now shipping. I think everybody who's ordered should probably have it in their hands or will do a day or two after this podcast goes out. It is the traditions issue, and we've already had some amazing feedback. You can order your copy on modernhuntsman.com, or if you're in the rest of the world outside of North America, you can order on uh, all the W's, thepacebrothers.com. If you want to win a copy of Volume 5, or indeed any volume from 1 through to 5, now is your chance. Simply rate and or review this show wherever you listen to podcasts. Or I guess we could probably accept a podcast share. So rate or, and review or a podcast share on some sort of social platform. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram uh, with at Byron J. Pace. And on Facebook, it's at Podcast Into the Wilderness. If you want 15% off all Modern Huntsman products on our website, thepacebrothers.com, simply use the discount code Into the Wilderness. Okay, to the show this week. And I interview Peter Christie, who is the author of Unnatural Companions, Rethinking Our Love of Pets in an Age of Extinction. I'm not going to give you any more than that because we we dig straight into it uh, in the interview. But if you own a pet, this is a must listen. And if you don't, well, it's still absolutely fascinating. Link to the book is in the show notes. This was recorded a few weeks back. So some of our initial chat about lockdown and uh, quarantine is a little dated by a few weeks. But but anyway, I hope that you enjoy this chat. I, I thoroughly enjoyed my discussion with Peter Christie. Peter, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Fantastic to have you on today, all the way from Canada. How uh, how are things with you right now? I, it's, we're in very weird times, and this is like how most of the conversations have started with almost every recording I've made in the last uh, well, the last three months actually. You're able to move around a little bit now with the the restrictions from the pandemic, or are you still pretty much locked down in your house? Uh, it it we've been. Fairly fortunate here, Brian, and, and, and thank you for having me on. Uh, that um, this my town is, or my city is a relatively small city, and we've been fairly successful in keeping uh, COVID more or less at bay. We've had a, a few hospitalized cases um, and a few in the community, but no um, uh, real records of community tra- transmission in this city. So, so fortunately, we, you know, we had a few people come in from elsewhere that, that have. Had the disease, but but uh, but we've uh, been fairly um, fairly effective at keeping it out of tr- transmission. And so things are just starting to open up today. Uh, the uh, Ontario government is allowing um, uh, restaurant patios to open, uh, and that will make a big difference. This is a tourist town. Um, uh, the sort of uh, patio culture is is very big in the in the downtown. 
before. So, so it, it should make a should make a big difference in terms of just the mood of the place. I think. Yeah, no, that's that's great. We're I think we're a little bit behind you guys, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to move around fairly soon, and, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to travel again soon, which will be good. Uh, you've got a yeah. a book out which is perfectly in line with the kind of stuff that we talk about on this podcast all the time. Uh, Unnatural companions rethinking our love of pets in an age of wildlife extinction. You take a lot of box for the things that fascinate me. I imagine launching a book right now, things are not probably exactly as you imagined they would be. I guess you'd probably be doing some tours around bookshops and promoting the book, but you'll be doing most of it from from your desk and on podcasts and interviews at the moment. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's certainly um, far different than I imagined. Um, <laughs> we, we, we don't do, we're, you know... I didn't expect to tour much. Um, don't do that too much. Um, but I didn't expect to be so eclipsed in terms of just attention, you know, um, to the book. So it's it's been it's been a little bit tough for sure. Yeah. So just before we 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 get into this, because it's a topic that comes up very often when we're looking. I mean, the the classic one is talking about cat owners. And their lack of understanding of how much their cats impact, particularly wild birds, but other wildlife in their gardens, even in urban settings. Uh, and that's before we even start talking about the, the food that cats in particular consume, but, but all pets. Uh, what, is your, what, is your, what is your background uh, that led you to, to writing this book? I write about uh, conservation and climate change uh, mostly, I guess, almost exclusively for the past 20 years or so. Most, I do um, quite a bit of journalism still, but I, but uh, I also work for conservation organizations who hire me to try and get their message out. Okay. So Um, lots of science communication. Yeah, that's science communication. So um, I've been doing, I've been doing that for a number of years. Um, This particular project really arose out of a story I was doing for a news magazine here in Canada called McLean's. Um, the government here had just decided to ban the import of salamanders uh, from elsewhere into, into Canada, uh, which was kind of an interesting, quirky little story. Um, apparently, salamanders are quite a popular pet in, in Canada. Um, but the reason for the, for the ban was because of a, a, a sudden spread of a of a fungal disease in across Europe or across Belgium in in particular, but a couple of other European countries were at that point just starting to show signs of a kind of the spread, a a kind of salamander pandemic, if you will. Um, And it began, uh, it was a, it's a brand new fungal disease uh, that uh, was traced back uh, to Asia uh, and was imported apparently to Europe through, through the pet trade. So uh, Canada and the United States, uh, put severe restrictions on pet, uh, the imports of pet salamanders in an effort to keep it out of North America, which is which is where most of the salamanders on the planet live. We actually have more salamanders in North America than anywhere else. Um, so, so they were very concerned about, about this getting loose in, in North America and the spread of it. So uh, that really just got me thinking of, of pets. Um, you know, I was, of course, very aware of the all the... Uh, the many years of news about the, the impact of cats on birds and small mammals in the wild. Um, so I began to just think, oh, how widespread is this as a, as a consequence? Pets um, affecting wildlife, how, how, how profound is it? And so I began to look around and, and through the literature and discovered that it's actually very, uh, very, very profound, far more than I could possibly have imagined you know, between a quarter and a third of all recent extinctions can be traced to um, animals that have been um, uh, spread by humans and and, and uh, were as, as essentially as pets. So, so um, that's an amazing you know, it, figure. It is. It's 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 staggering to think. Um, uh, you know that that includes, of course, the spread of disease. Uh, diseased animals, um, in, in particular, uh, another fungal disease that was affecting. Um, Frogs is 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 uh, has been traced to pet uh, to the pet trade as well, and it's extinguished about um, I presumed 90, 90 species of of tropical frogs in in the past uh, uh, twenty years or so. Uh, 
in any case, the the uh, the impacts really just uh, just staggered me, and that's when and that's when I decided that this was a this was a book length project. I'd need to yeah. spend spend some time uh, really putting this together, and and uh, luckily Island Press uh, uh, saw things the same way and and uh, and supported the project. So let's let's talk about cats and dogs first, because I think cat you know, cats and dogs are very common pets and. A lot of our listeners will have one or the other, or maybe both. I have one dog that is hiding from the heat right now on my concrete floor. I believe you're a dog owner as well. Indeed, yeah, yeah. a long time pet owner, and 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 I think you know, Brian. The you know, when you asked me what got me interested, I think what's primarily uh, at the root of this is that I am a pet owner and I'm a lover of wildlife, and I think of those two things as kind of the same. And when it began to dawn on me that being a pet owner was actually doing harm uh, in, in the sort of wildlife world. I just thought that that's, a, that's the weirdest irony. And I really think it's something that people, pet owners, animal lovers really want to know about. Yeah. So, I mean, we both have dogs. Let's talk about dogs for a minute. I don't think, I mean, my dogs are, are, I mean, he, my dog's retired now, but in his uh, in his heyday, he was a hunting dog. So he was like, a, you know, a working dog, so, so a, an animal that was fairly under control. It's not like he had free reign of, you know, free free reign of the wilderness around me. And uh, I live in a fairly rural setting. But what uh, what are the negative consequences of dog ownership? Because I would think that most people would assume that uh, dogs don't have much of a a negative impact, you know, especially if you compare them to cats. I mean, cats are the cats are the villains of most of these stories that you see in the print. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, it 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 depends. You know, when you're t- talking about dogs writ large, it's it's quite a surprise for sure. Um, cats, uh, you know, when you're talking, we mentioned extinctions before. Cats have been uh, sort of pegged as a as a leading uh, threat in the extinction of, of, of about 63 species in recent history. Um, whereas dogs, in fact, ha- have been uh, or thought to be primarily responsible for 11. So that's, so that's, you know, it puts it in some sort of perspective. It's not a small, it's not a small thing that most now, uh, you know, a lot of that it would be in different circumstances than your own uh, outside of uh, these, you know, sort of wealthy countries where people, do tend to keep um, their dogs under uh, quite a bit of control. However, um, dogs uh, have I- impacts that are often unthought of. Uh, people who uh, let their dogs just uh, um, tear through the forest, for example, when they're in, in a nice walk through the woods, um, you know, they may see their dog, you know, chasing deer or 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 other mammals, and you know, just those impacts of fear, the uh, um, the the fact that the, the animal has to run for its life and and exhaust itself you know all of those things can have impacts on the on the potential survival of the thing in the in the first place but dogs also eat eggs they uh, they dig they can sm- sniff out reptile eggs and and dig eggs out of um, uh, in 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 uh, cent- south and central America for example they're 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 famously digging up and and eating um, uh, sea turtle eggs um, and uh, other reptiles, um, but uh, dogs also have um, quite a profound impact as 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 vectors for uh, canine distemper virus, which is um, which is a quite a um, uh, quite an active virus, a little bit like the one we're facing now, insofar as it has uh, the capacity to jump species and and has been known to have severe impacts. Um, on say lion populations in Africa, um, you know, basically from pet dogs kept by villagers nearby, or uh, or uh, in fact, it, it's basically wiped the African wild dog out of the Serengeti altogether. Um, and, and you know, those 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 kinds of impacts that are less likely to be seen in in Australia, for example, um, there's a, a, a an endangered plover that. Uh, and one of the primary uh, concerns of, for conservationists there and trying to keep it, its populations up is people letting their dogs run on the beach. And the dogs aren't really particularly interested in the plovers, but they, they just tear around and just trample 
trample these these nests. So it's 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 a it's a funny it's a funny you know dogs are just dogs are just clumsy like we are. <laughs> so they, <laughs> so they, they're roaring around like a bull in a china shop and 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 can do damage without us even realizing it. Yeah, it's um I haven't I hadn't actually thought about the uh, the implications of of the ownership in. Uh, on continents like Africa for, for a while. I did know of the, the wild dog story you were talking about, and I know that there had been vaccination programs for local villages to get their dogs vac- vaccinated for that very reason. But it's uh, yeah. it, it's it's very hard to, to get on top of it in these rural communities. And it doesn't take long before there are new young puppies and, and litters and dogs that are not vaccinated and the whole cycle starts again. Um, it's It's... Yeah, it's a, it's a problem that uh, you know that element of it um, is something that I think a lot of people don't really think about is the uh, the disease transmission vector, um, which is in terms of its widespread effect is probably more prevalent than um, the actual like killing of other animals. It, it, in 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 terms of its impacts on on populations and the continued existence of particular species, it, it is larger, I think, uh, according to the IUCN data. It, so it would be, it would be, have a greater impact for sure. Hmm. Um, and if we turn, turn our attention to, if we turn our attention to cats, it's it's a similar kind of story, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, the 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 death rate at the the, the teeth and uh, and claws of rat at the teeth and claws of cats is is far higher, uh, and even among domestic cats in you know very in sort of you know suburban uh, England, uh, you don't have to go out into the the wilds and remote regions of Africa to have. Uh, really quite devastating effects on on populations like you have with dogs with more freedom to roam your very seemingly docile cat that'll be sleeping in your house during the day is sometimes causing carnage at night yeah that's right um yeah cats you know cats are you know a, a, a better documented um and more and, and obviously more a substantial problem they're just they're, 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 i mean they're simply speaking they're just better predators than than dogs are they're you know more recently domesticated by you know uh, uh tens of millennia um uh it's, so they're 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 um you know and they and they're independent hunters not pack hunters like 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 the descendants of dogs used to be so so they 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 on their own are very very effective killers and um and uh they take out a lot, a lot of animals, um, you know, in, in North America, well, in, in the United States, for, for instance, it's between one and 4 billion birds have been documented 22 billion, uh, potential, potentially, um, small mammals. It, it's over what it's, period of time uh, is that? Uh, that's a, that's annual. That's an, that's, wow. those are annual, annual figures, that's yeah. a crazy yeah. number. Yeah. They, yeah. They are, they're, 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 they're staggering. And those are, those are the, that's the research from uh, Peter Mara and his group from Smithsonian. <clears throat> um, they did it, uh, I guess it's about seven years ago that those, those kinds of numbers kind of came out and, and that, that has really shown no real s- sign of slowing down in, in Canada here. We, we estimate that we lose about 300 uh, million uh, birds to, to cats, um, um, here, so it's 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 still it's it. These are these are staggering, staggering figures when you think about it. Um, you know, I guess the the cat people would say a lot of those animals will you know are are the young migratory birds that may have perished by other means along the way, and that's partly true. <clears throat> However, um, that just the sheer numbers make it uh, worthwhile, and we also you know very you know, worthwhile to consider rather. We also know very well that the introduction of cats <clears throat> along with rats and, and, um, and, and foxes and pigs, uh, to, to island, uh, to islands around the world have really, um, have been instrumental in, in population 
uh, losses and, and declines in, in, in uh, of, of staggering proportions and, and, and the extinctions. So, so we're, we're pretty clear on the, on the question of cats. They're, they are uh, subsidized killers that have a very, very direct impact on, on the wild world. Hmm. I, I think the interesting, uh, the interesting element of this that comes to mind is that, and you bring this up in in your book, is that pet ownership is a as a parallel for our our love and enjoyment of wildlife, but it's like the wildlife that we can kind of control because we've domesticated it, and for the most part, it lives in our house, and we we get that interaction and enjoyment out of it. In recent years, there's become this increasing awareness of human impact, and, and, and that is tied to pet ownership as well, like we've just been discussing, um, on the planet, um, you know, p- particularly ecosystems and uh, our negative impact on, on wildlife in particular. And almost in this, this love of wildlife through pet ownership is inadvertently smothering and killing the very wildlife that we're in a way trying to emulate through ownership of animals. Yeah, that's right. So, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's got kind of a, 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 a sort of through line theme that I that I tried to develop through the book is, is really centers around an idea. It's just a theoretical idea because it's basically kind of scientifically unprovable, but it's a an idea that put forward by um, the Harvard biologist Edward O. Wilson many years ago, a, a book that I read when I was a, a, a youngster in university. It's um, it, it it's a very powerful, very interesting book. Anyway, he put forward this notion of biophilia. It's essentially the idea that uh, to get ahead in the sort of evolutionary race, um, people or our, ans- or our very, very early ancestors uh, basically had to develop a an interest and uh, a fascination with other living things. So essentially um, it, it's in our D- DNA uh, because uh, in, in order to basically f- find or hunt, um, uh, hunt successfully, you had to be curious about, about uh, the animals you were hunting in order to learn about their habits and, and, and uh, better a- be better able to hunt them down. Similarly, um, the animals that were hunting you, uh, you wanted to know about them so that, that, uh, so that they wouldn't uh, kill you, or or the same with 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 plants. That, you know, you had to know harvest time. You had to know where they grew. Um, so these kinds of this whole notion, this fascination, this wonder at the wild world, is is something that that Wilson suggests uh, is likely really deeply embedded in who we are as human beings. And so he, in fact, he goes as so far as to say it's really the kind of fundamental basis of our curiosity, learning, and wonder with the wonder at the world. So, so it's, a, it's an essential part of our restlessness and, and curiosity that makes us people. So, 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 so that idea is, he think he suggests in his book, and this is now what, about four decades ago, um, it, it should be like a, an impetus for conservation. This, this, this fascination should be able to propel us to thinking about uh, the wild world as essential to who we are as people. And that we should perhaps put put um, puts a lot of more effort than we do now into into keeping it around because we don't want to um, you know, basically leave the world without that sort of piece of ourselves. And so uh, he suggests that's a, that will be maybe conservation salvation. And in my book, I'm basically suggesting well, pet pet ownership is kind of subverting that idea. We're essentially uh, by bringing animals into our lives and sort of in these controlled kind of circumstances. We're essentially satisfying this need, but but leaving so much else out. It's. Uh, I think there'll, there'll be a lot of pet owners listening to this, not suddenly having this dawning realization that maybe that is their kind of, the kind of substitution that they're making. Uh, especially with busy lives, we don't have we don't have the time to immerse ourselves. Even even people who who really want to, we don't have the time to immerse ourselves in nature uh, in the same way as um, our ancestors will have done. And uh, having having these the animals in our house is a way to do that when you come back from work. Indeed, and 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 you know just all the more so, right? I think we're you know about half of our our seven point seven billion people are now living urban lives. Um, it's and that's going to only increase. 
I think what I really want to say, Brian, is that, that, that there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I, I in fact, I, I, you know, I encourage it. And I think, I think, I think Wilson would have, would encourage it. In fact, he, he does sort of encourage it. I think the, the, the notion, you know, pets are, uh, important to our lives. They, they do give us a, a level of satisfaction and connection to, to non-human ways of existing on the planet that, 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 that it, that is important to us. Um, I think the point of the book is not to basically say, oh, we need to give up pets and, and focus on wildlife. I think my hope is that by sort of recognizing why and what sort of satisfaction we get from pets will uh, impel pet owners, massive, as you mentioned, massive lot of people, um, you know, about, I think, about half of households in your country, I believe, something similar in Canada, two thirds of households in America. Um, you know, these are a lot of people, millions and millions um, of people, if they just sort of sort of looked at their pet and said, you know, why I love you is the reason that I should care about the rest of wildlife and, and, and life on the planet and, and put some measure of their thinking and care and concern uh, uh, for their pet in, into a care and concern for the, the, the wider wild world. Yeah, the, I, I, thought, I think I read it somewhere in the book, but I, I might be misremembering. You, you gave an idea of the, uh, the biomass or number of, of pets on the planet compared to people. I mean, people who have pets very often will have more than one. So are we, in, in terms of cats and dogs and, and terrapins and goldfish, do we have more pets than people? Uh, we do in North America, for sure. We have, a, 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 we have about uh, um, a third more pets uh, than people in, in, in America. There's about... Uh, Ooh, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, about 400, just under four. In 2016, there were about 400 million dogs, cats, fish, birds, reptiles, and other you know, small creatures in the homes of, of about uh, 84 million Americans. Um, um, and, no, wow. in about eight, 84 million American households. So, so about 400 million pets um, then. So, so, you know, in, in Canada... We have about you know seven to eight million dogs and almost nine million cats. Um, you guys, you guys, uh, the UK about fifty one million pets. So so yeah, gives you okay. Some- well, yeah, we got about sixty eight million people, so it's not uh, yeah. it's not too far off. I, I'm yeah. just thinking as you, as you're talking about this, and I, I'm I, I agree with you. I think that you can. You can harness this, or, or people with a the realization there can be a harnessing of the love for your pets that can cross over into a concern for wildlife and the environment. But in a landscape that we live in right now, where we are increasingly aware of the burden of resources around the planet and the the finite nature of many resources, especially as we continually encroach into um, wild spaces or, or the few wild spaces that are left. This is just feeding this number of pets has a massive impact in itself. And I'm just wondering where the if the net gain is worth it. Now, as a dog owner, I would say that absolutely it is worth it because I, I gain so much from owning my dog. And uh, looking at how comfortable he is right now, I think he's pretty happy with his life too. <laughs> um, but if I, I'm trying to take a non-emotional view on it, is there a net gain to owning all of this domestic, all of these domestic animals which don't really... Uh, contribute anything they're not feeding us that we're not talking about domestic livestock here they're not feeding us these are we have these pets for uh emotional support in a way and for our psychological well-being yeah so so i i guess the argument i would i would make brian is that I, i'm not a person who would ex- who would separate that uh, emotional piece I I, I I i think that that is an essential part of this puzzle now, what you say is absolutely true. We we are uh, we are through our pets 
consuming resources that are at a sort of staggering uh, to a staggering degree. So what I would su- suggest is that we just that through a consciousness of 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 these impacts, we 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 could you know potentially put you know a rain on it. So you know so that the people who have seven cats you know may be encouraged in the future to perhaps. Um, you know, re- re- reduce that to 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 a single cat or or or, or a pair or something. You know, to basically to to try and uh, 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 you know to, to pull, pull this back, right? I mean, it's 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 it is um, you know quite quite uh, um, you know. It, I think it's just the the lack of awareness that really is having uh, that's that's sort of let this thing run essentially a, a mock. You know, um, uh, you know a, a bet. About you know about uh, you know the the the, um, the amount of even just you know forage fishes that you know that that humans you know, that's the largest fishes so the anchovies um, sardines so those kinds of yeah. small glimmering fishes that, that that people drag net out of the out of the sea at, at, in enormous quantities I mean they're you know these are resilient populations in a lot of cases where you know these that you know they have these extremely um, uh, fecund and, and prolific breeding um, strategies but but even still uh, we're, we're we're dragging you know billions of tons of this stuff out of the out of the sea uh, it's it's having direct impacts and this science suggests uh, um, on seabird populations that re- rely on these things um, and and huge amounts of this um, you know, you know. Of course, we use it. We, we use a lot of it in fish oils and 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 various other uh, food um, and even fertilizer uh, uh, applications. But 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 huge amounts of it, about about a, a, a seventh of it or so, uh, goes into uh, cat food and and uh, and uh, and dog food and uh, and fish food. You know, these these kinds of things. So so it's it's you know it's it's significant. Similarly. Um, you know the protein that's that's um, that's taken from uh, cattle ranching. Um, uh, you know uh, that that you know that that is spreading like wildfire across across uh, the tropics and, and toppling tropical habitat. Um, you know as we speak um, in in large in large amounts just to feed the, the beef cattle industry. Well, a lot of that uh, protein from those that cattle is 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 feeding um, our, our pets. Um, you know, in, in North America, it's 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 about a third. It's a, there's an inter- really interesting in fact. I thought with um, in Australia, uh, fish protein, uh, m- protein from fisheries, um, cats eat more uh, fish protein uh, per cat than than Australians eat, eat fish. Uh, you know, fish and seafood per cat. So, <laughs> So that, that you know that's 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 uh, that's a lot of fish. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but it's something that's always crossed my mind when we talk about fish and cats is that a cat, as a, a mammal, a land mammal, wouldn't have normally eaten fish. Yeah, okay, they might have scavenged fish along the edges of rivers or maybe you know wild cats in North America would have eaten fish at certain times of year when the salmon were running and dying off. Uh, but that wouldn't have been the primary component part of their diet throughout the year. I don't know why we, we maybe it's just because it's easy and because it is a resource which at a time we we thought was inexhaustible was this uh, the, the wild fisheries around, around the world and it, it's relatively speaking cheap to cheap to harvest and so that's why we feed our cats fish yeah i guess i, I guess the the answer to the question is you know in some respects i suppose it's a, a little bit of good news because as as you mentioned um there are actually sustainable ways of of of, of fishing. Um, uh, you know, the, these these forage fishes, for example, can can reproduce. Um, they have crazy population cycles that nobody has really nailed down very well yet. So that's the, that's a that's a deep concern. But but nevertheless, they they, they are you know a, a lot of these, and uh, you know if if they there is there is a potential to for, for sustainable fisheries. I I know there was a recent paper in Science. 
uh, last year, I guess, and which, which spoke about just how resilient oceans could be if we lay off for just a little while, we could actually recover a lot of fisheries and a lot of fish stocks that and 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 biodiversity that that have really been decimated simply just from greed. But but uh, I think what what what, is, what you're alluding to is a is a good example of you know at least some good news. Um, we're we're dragging fish out of the sea. Um, it, we're we're doing a lot of damage in that, but probably not as much damage if if we let cats go as we do in in the case of feral cats in America to to to, to eat, eat and kill billions of birds and and mammals. So 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 the 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 upshot would be if if uh, if left to their druthers, th- this many cats would basically decimate um, uh, the you know the population of of, of terrestrial ver- vertebrates if, yeah. if if we let if we let them. Hmm. Yeah. It's I'm I'm wondering, uh, you you the the number that, that comes from your book is uh, for uh, support, uh, 170, 117 billion dollar pet industry. That is a lot of money, and I'm wondering whether there is an opportunity there with the correct knowledge for pet owners of the impact globally that there isn't a way that some of that money within the pet industry could be set aside to help counter the negative effects of pet ownership some form of of tax to to alleviate these impacts yeah, wouldn't that be great? That yeah, would, conservation I, I, tax I'm, on pet ownership. Yeah, I, I'm exactly. You know, I I um, make some mention of this in in the book, but I, I you know if 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 we could just make pet owners aware of 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 what it is they see in their pets and why that is also reflected in the wider world, even though they may never get a chance to see a a wolf in northern Canada, you know, just just the idea that it's there. I mean, you know, they, you know, they, they, they could, they could follow David Attenborough around, you know, on, the, on television, <laughs> you know, but you know, it's out there. It, they, these are, these are real living things that, that, that are absolutely fascinating to us. And, and, and if we could just sort of suggest to them, you know, just a, just a, just a modicum, you know, like the, just a fraction, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, in 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 America, uh, uh, you know, spending on 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 uh, uh, spending by the states and and federal government to protect its endangered species is about forty five times less than what people spend on their pets. So you know, I mean, if you could, if, if 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 you could just you know ha- have people pony up, um, you know, ten ten percent of their of of their annual. Uh, uh, spending on their on their on their pets uh, you know conservation would be a way to the races it's it's you know uh, I, there's lots of research that shows you know we uh seriously underfund conservation around the world and that's part of the reason that's part of the reason that you know that uh, extinctions on the planet are about a thousand times or, or between a hundred and a thousand times uh faster than they would be without humans on it um, you know, that's, this is, you know, this is a calamity. This is a, this is a crisis, you know, along the lines of, of the demise of the dinosaurs where the extinctions are that, um, are that are happening that fast. We could, we could be tackling that, um, with, with, with some success, if we we're quite a bit of success, if we just simply put some resources into it right now, we're, we're nowhere close. Mm. I, I've, in my mind, there, there's a fairly simple way to, to funnel money out of that. In the in the same way, in and I'm not sure if you have an equivalent type of tax in Canada. I'm uncertain, but in North America, uh, the Pittman Robertson Act takes a and I'm going to get the percentage wrong off the top of my head, but I think it's about 15 percent tax on all sporting goods. So whether that's ammunition, guns, bows and arrows, um, fishing goods. And that most of that money primarily goes into fish the uh, to fish to fund the uh, game and fish departments in in each yeah. state. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. a very similar mechanism could be used within the pet industry. I don't think it would be too difficult to implement. I mean, it, it, there may be a lot of resistance, but I don't think it would be very difficult to implement because the the structure already exists within sporting goods. 
Yes, I, no, absolutely. Similarly, in Canada, we have, um, uh, at least in Ontario, the, the provincial government, um, uh, you know, ha has a licensing system in which uh, in which the you know fishing and hunting license fees go go essentially directly to to the conservation um, efforts and, and game management efforts of of the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. It, it, it's it's an absolutely brilliant idea, I think, and and and. Uh, and and, and w one well worth pursuing. I think, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's, you know, you say there would be resistance, you know, there would be to, to some degree, but it, people are, the, the, you know, what, 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 I, I think there's a, there's a, yeah, in 2016 or something uh, from the American Pet Products Association, they anticipated uh, pet owners were going to spend something like $400 million dollars on on pet costumes for the for for, Hollow, for, for Halloween, right? like, yeah, so, so so I think the pet owners, generally speaking, are are you know like like parents, um, um, very willing to 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 to, to pay uh, to, to 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 pamper their pets, and and if they were aware that that this was you know just a little bit more for you know I, I don't think that the industry itself would have to suffer necessarily. Um, um, you know, I think the consumers. You know, I think I think the industry could come on side, by and prove its 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 green credentials. It's a, it's it's a lot like, uh, you know, those the sort of eco label approaches that have been successful in in coffee and cocoa. Yeah, uh, yeah, fair trade more, or yeah, yeah fair rain, trade, rain, more, rainforest, um, rainforest yeah, alliance. It, yeah, if if we could if we could get a program like that up and going. Um, uh, you know, with with some um, some measure of monitoring, so that so that the, the, nobody's greenwashing, but 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 to, to 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 basically make make these industries kind of responsive and 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 to to, to turn over some of this uh, this largesse to to conservation causes, I think that would be a that would be a tremendous step in the right direction for sure, and it wouldn't have to be large as you. As I say, like it's like the, what what we need in conservation, um, it, you know, it's it's a, it's a hell of a lot less than than what our pets need to, to survive in our houses. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Um, just turning our attention away from uh, cats and dogs. Well, actually, no. Before we do that, what can people do to mitigate the risk to wildlife from their pets, particularly to with in terms of cats and dogs, because I want to talk about other less common um, pets, you know, after we finish talking about cats and dogs. Yeah. So cats, cats and dogs are, 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 are relatively straightforward forward, as we've already sort of suggested and, and spoken around. There are, there are things that you can do that are quite obvious. And, um, you, you know, I think the, the, the more ardent conservationists would say, well, simply don't let your cat outside. Um, I know that there that, um, that cat, cat lovers, particularly in your country, I think are are very resistant to the notion. Um, n n most uh, uh, UK cat owners, you know, this research suggests actually have no idea just how deadly their cats are. But but uh, um, but people, you know, cats are you know, the wildness of cats is 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 their appeal. They have a, a, you know a lot of a lot of what I sort of suggest is important about our relationship with animals is kind of exists in cats. It, you know, we can, we can vicariously live that wild life by letting them outside and watching them bring home a, um, you know, a, a, a meadow vole and drop it at our, at our feet. It, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it, they're, it's, they're amazing to watch and it's a, it's a fascinating process. Um, the, the, <clears throat> the thing about it is uh, it's not natural. And and you know these aren't these aren't natural creatures in in the UK ecosystem. So we need you know we need to be kind of aware of that. <clears throat> so the 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 so the the short answer is just keep them inside. Now a lot of people say, well, my cat used to going outside is going to go crazy if I you know lock it in indoors all of a sudden. And I and I can see that. You know, this is not a uh, this doesn't have to be an all or nothing necessarily. Although in some cases it may be. Um, uh, proposal. I think that in some cases we could just simply say, okay, the next cat you get, 
make sure that it's in, indoors. And for the cat that you do have, um, use um, some kind of uh, prophylactic technique like bells help for for birds, bird, birds and mammals. So, so the bell around its neck just tinkles and alerts a bird or a mammal, and they, they're they're quite effective. Somewhere around uh, you know a fifty percent reduction in in, in predation rates. <clears throat> um, uh, slightly more effective and kind of fascinating is a, a, a sort of a more recent invention called a cat bib. Yeah, what is that? Little... I, I saw you mention that, but I had no idea what what it was referring to. Yeah, it's a little bit like a little baby bib. It just hangs around the collar of a of a cat, and and it's funny. It's it they've you know, just, uh, demonstrated it actually doesn't hinder the cat's um, capacity to move around in the in the uh, wild very very much. Um, you know, there's some you know no, really no more than a collar in terms of getting snagged and that kind of thing. So uh, it just sort of hangs just over its chest. Um, and interestingly, the, the animal can move around very, very well, but, but it's just, um, it was designed, uh, it's fascinating, it's designed um, because, the, because cats have a very characteristic pounce when they, when they hunt, and, the, and their feet curl up underneath, under their chest, and they leap forward and then sort of release their feet. Uh, and, the, okay. and, 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 and this bib just interferes with that action enough to, to, to severely... Uh, impact their effectiveness, particularly particularly birds, but also mammals. But but birds in particular, that it's it's very very effective. It just just it just it just uh, frustrates them just enough, right, to 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 get to get there. So they can so people can do that and and um, and and trim their cat's claws and those those kinds of um, you know there are a number of of sort of mitigating things that they can do in the meantime before you know as they kind of wean their cats off. Um, outdoor uh, activity altogether. Um, you know, cats. So get your get your cat a cat, bib. That sounds like the solution. Yeah, get your cat a bib. <laughs> get your cat a bib. <clears throat> get your cat a bib. Get your cat a bell. Um, the, you know, these are these are things that you can do, and and keep your keep your dog in, under control. Don't don't needlessly let it you know tear around through the forest while you're having a nice walk in the in the countryside. Um, you know, keep it nearby at your side. Don't let it chase down uh, deer or other mammals, um, uh, you know, those kinds of things. So don't just let it outside to, to wander and, and, and dig up turtle eggs or, 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 uh, you know, find, you know, those kinds of things, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that's, or, or run or run around in, in beaches or in, in national parks. These are, you know, these are common sense things that you and I can do yeah. as animal owners. Um, so, but I think the, the main one is is that you alluded to in your last question is really to come together as animal lovers and insist, you know, from the pet industry and and from the people who who sort of regulate the you know your 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 MPs or your your politicians, the people who regulate these things, and try and come together to to make the pet industry. And pet owners together, uh, responsible or responsive to to wild animals as well. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, being responsible is key. Now, to to other species, I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking. Well, I tell you, the, the one thing that I hadn't considered actually, because I've definitely been guilty of this in the past, is cleaning a fish tank. Explain the care that needs to be taken with that because we're not talking, and I'm not talking about uh, releasing non native fish into waterways. I'm just talking about the actual water from cleaning a fish tank. And I think a lot of people are going to be like, oh, I really need to consider this a bit more. Yeah, <clears throat> true enough. Yeah, no, it's it, uh, and that, that's a big one. It's been a, a big one, particularly here in, in Ontario. But um, people, and you, you say you've been guilty. I, 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 Hold my hand up high as well. Um, uh, you, you know, you, when you cleaning your fish tank, a uh, lot of water in a fish tank. Uh, it, it's 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 a pain in the butt to try and pour it down a sink or, or or even down your toilet. So so people just wander outside and and pour it into the nearest stream or into a back pond or or whatever it is. And <clears throat> and what goes with that fish water is is often. And we were talking about diseases or the pathogens 
that the, that these tropical fish have brought with them from far away. So, so, so you know, um, uh, it can be the release of disease. It can be the relief of of, of um, foreign algal, you know, algae. It can be the release of of uh, snails and 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 mollusks of different different varieties. Uh, little plant bits that have come, <clears throat> you know, that 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 can uh, establish themselves in in waterways. Uh, you know, it's you know the potential for invasions, whether it's disease. Or or, uh, or or foreign plants and, and and animals is 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 quite is quite considerable. You know, I mean, it's just it's just the same thing as um, you know the ballast water that comes with these uh, ship big ships that that have essentially fouled uh, and, and transformed the ecosystems of the lakes of, of uh, the uh, Great Lakes of, of North America. Here, you know, um, it's essentially you just it's just a you're just taking. Uh, an entire ecosystem from somewhere else and, and, and releasing it into, into, into this sort of, uh, 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 native place and, and, and the consequences can be quite significant. And, and then, you know, and then there's just simply the release of, of fish. We have a, we have a, a particular problem with, with goldfish in, in, uh, gold small, fish. <laughs> in, in, with, in, in, with gold, gold released pet goldfish in, in, in small uh, lakes in, in, in and around it. Yeah, I can, I can totally imagine this because where I went, to, where I went to university in Stirling in Scotland, uh, the whole university campus was built around a lake. And of course, as students do, I guess, uh, when you're staying in halls of residence, residence, um, people would get fish for company, I suppose. And yeah. uh, at the end of the, your year, it's, you got you go home for the summer. And what the hell are you going to do with the fish? Most people don't take it with them. <laughs> so they dump yeah. these fish, uh, these goldfish, into the lake. And there were some massive goldfish. And I mean, they basically reverted back to being like carp. Uh, but yeah. what are the yeah. what are the direct consequences uh, there? I, I mean. It was an artificial lake anyway, and I don't think there was any way for them to get into other waterways. I think it was fairly self-contained, so the the effects there are, I would suggest, fairly minimal. And we did have a massive aquaculture um, department there, so I think they probably would have been on top of it if it had been you know a bigger problem beyond that lake. But what are the impacts that you're seeing from people releasing goldfish? You know, I don't know this story in Ontario that well. I mean, they're 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 you know they're not they're not um, they're not surviving typically long enough to to get into that sort of koi place where they're competing with the with the native carp here. We have a we have a large native carp here that's very successful uh, in <clears throat> in Lake Ontario and elsewhere. Um, but they do uh, you know the, you know they're they're going to eat the fry of of other fishes, including sports fishes, um, bass, and whatnot. Um, they're you know, they're uh, more of a nuisance, perhaps than 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 a, a profound problem at this point. You know, they're they're they they occupy, uh, you know, a, 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 a space in the in the sort of uh, they offer occupy a niche in, in the sort of ecosystem that that might otherwise have 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 satisfied and 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 sustained um, native native species of different varieties. Yeah. Um, and they are, and they're pro- prolific and tough, right? They're, they're, they're just, they are tough. They're, they're, yeah. They're, yeah, they, they can, they can, they can survive, um, um, the perturbations and, and problems that uh, other native species may have, but may be less successful at. So, so, so they're, they pose more of a threat than, a, than, than, than a known risk, I guess, at this point, but uh, you know, there are lots and lots of examples of, of released pets, I, you know, my my favorite was because I I went down to for the book I went down to Florida to 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 uh, go out into the Everglades to 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 hunt Burmese pythons with oh, with yes. a very with a very colorful character and it's a very interesting story. So here's a case where um, you know I think the first was discovered somewhere in the late seventies in Everglades National Park, but a Burmese, of a Burmese Python. So, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, speculation was, and in fact, I think, you know, it's been sort of demonstrated that people in Florida love to love their exotic pets. It's actually kind of an exotic pet capital, um, you know, Miami there. And, and, uh, and similarly, you know, they buy, a uh, you know, a, an eight inch long 
a boa constrictor from from uh, the local pet store and they feed it for a couple of years and discover that suddenly it's three feet long and and they don't really have uh, you know room or, or or any inclination to care any longer for for a, a snake of that size and so they release it into the into the local marsh well now these animals have essentially uh, are replacing the apex predators of the place they're the the allig- American alligators that <clears throat> are so common there and and there are crocodiles as well, um, and uh, in fact, uh, and are eating them. They're in there, so now there are uh, an estimated close to a million of these uh, pythons, and some of them are enormous. Uh, you know, twelve to sixteen. So they've adapted feet. very well to that environment. Oh yeah, they you know they 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 love it. Um, you know, because there's the you know, the the place used to be filled with these marsh hares. It was, it was endemic to to the Everglades and and these these things are you know and and all the the herons and whatnot these these animals are going crazy it's like a, a smorgasbord for them because there's, <laughs> nothing, there's nothing nothing that really uh, occupied that 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 sort of niche the crocodiles of course we would were, were you know eating these birds and but stuff, they're even but eating crocodiles. the they're even eating the it's alligators there is it Allig- do they have alligators and crocodiles yeah, yeah, on it, it? they're both yeah, they're both, Sorry, yeah. They're, and, but the, these pythons are now eating the alligators and crocodiles aren't they Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's and it's and it's staggering to see. We went out on this hunt, and we, these these snakes are massive. And it's really it's really uh, it's an incredible. So what are they doing there? To, to I mean, have they accepted that they will now forever be there, or are they trying to remove them out of the environment? It, they are trying to control them. Um, if they could, they would remove them. Uh, they haven't found a way to to remove them, but they're but they do. Uh, at least the biologists I spoke to do believe that that the, these control efforts, which are you know you might think are kind of arcane, they they essentially hire uh, these guys to go out and drive the the levees through the through the marsh, you know, with their trucks and and look for snakes, and they jump out and kind of wrestle them and then <laughs> bring them ashore and dispatch them. That, that that's that's um, that's really the the most effective way they've come up with so far for controlling these things, but the, the, I think that their hope is that they can at least uh, you know contain or restrict the the um, uh, you know the expansion of the of of the of the, uh, the animals any further and try to keep their populations in check to some degree. I, I don't know. It certainly seems to me that it's been um, something of a losing battle so far. They, you know, these control methods, the the extensive nature of the Python patrols is that they have now is is rather new. So they're still still waiting to see what they end up with uh, at the end of the day. But they they take out thousands of pythons every year in the, in the past couple of years. So it, it may make a difference. What they're really concerned about is that these animals seem to be uh, acclimatizing to the cool, um, you know, just basically through natural selection. And um, with that, they've managed to sort of um, move further and further north out of the marsh. And so there's a considerable concern that, that uh, you know, as you get further up the uh, Florida peninsula, um, the, the Everglades <clears throat> really laps right up against suburban uh, America. You know these little streams and whatnot that sort of wind their way into the, into suburban backyards. And so the last thing they want is these you know a twelve foot python you know uh, winding its way up into uh, you know the, the suburban backyard of a of, of a of a family that has you know two five year old twins or something yeah. like that. You know. Do the biologists in the Everglades have they managed to identify any species that the pythons are pushing the populations to a point where they're they're declining? <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, I think that basically uh, biologists I spoke to something on the order of ninety percent of of mammal populations in in the Everglades, including marsh hares, uh, including even the Florida panther. Uh, are of, of concern and and de- and and declining population. Um, whether it, how much how many of those are are uh, attributable to the pythons? Um, I think they could safely say that the, the marsh hares um, um, 
uh, and uh, other s- smaller mammals of, of, of that sort of size, uh, you know, that's, you know, we, we can see that that's a fairly direct impact, but the others, um, you know, have to speculate a bit, but, but uh, you know, But deer, there could also be knock-on impacts. I mean, this is, it's a, it's a complex web. If yeah. uh, if you lose marsh hares and other mammals of that kind of size, there will be predators which rely on them as prey, and so you will end up with a knock on effect there. So yeah, it, it's very I, complicated. Yeah, it's a cascade for sure. Yeah, and yeah. and the same is you know the same with same with birds and aquatic life. You know, um, you you knock out a bunch of you know those those waiting birds. You know, take take a, a significant portion of the population, and then suddenly. Uh, you know the, the sort of local predators of of, of smaller fishes are are uh, can can explode and and these these again have knocked down effects of, of on the the prey fishes for those and so it, it yeah it's a really it's just an ecosystem disruption is what it is. Yeah, uh, I as we've been talking, I've become aware that um, there's kind of this discussion is split in my mind between. Uh, the pet ownership of the type that we've been talking about, pet um, cats and dogs and, and fish, and you know even some of the more exotic pets like uh, like pythons, and that is sort of ownership in in good faith of those animals. And with when it comes to cats and dogs, I don't think there's too much issue about where they're being sourced. But there's this whole other element of it, which is wild animals being extracted from nature to be used within the pet trade. Uh, let's maybe talk to that for a bit because that's it's a, it's kind of a it's a whole different beast that you, it's the the effect in my mind is the uh, the loss of of those wild creatures from their natural environment more so than it is what how those animals will then impact the environment that they're now finding themselves in. Yeah, this is another whole story, isn't it? it, it, it yes. This is another so, book, actually. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, in your it, book, but you could write a whole yeah. book just on on the well. A lot of that's illegal wildlife trade because um, quite well, even as, with some species which are you can legally extract from um, from the wild. There's a lot of illegal trade which slips in there and uses it as cover. Yeah. So, so you know, just ignoring the illegal trade for a minute, you know, uh, or, or rather sort of lumping the, the two together, you know, birds in particular, bird species, there, there are almost 600 species of birds that, that are commonly traded uh, around the world. Uh, as, as pets, um, uh, you know, uh, reptiles, are, you know, not you know, somewhere around 500, you know, um, uh, mammals somewhat less, you know, we're around a hundred, but, 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 you know, the, the statistics are remarkable, like rep, rep, those reptiles, those 500 or so species that are targeted by the pet industry in general, they are, five times more likely to be listed as threatened with extinction than reptiles that are not. So, you know, it really just, it just speaks to it. Right. And, um, uh, mammals, pet traded mammals, it's three times more likely, um, you know, um, in, in the bird world, one in, in four of every parrot species on the planet is considered at risk of, of vanishing altogether. And so, so, you know, parrots are extremely popular, you know, the most popular pet, um, pet bird group throughout the world mm. I, I have a very hard time with um pet parrots in my uh and i don't know whether that's i don't know whether it's fair because it means that i kind of have a hierarchy in my mind of what pets are acceptable and what pets aren't uh but when it comes to to parrots and i i think maybe it's because of the knowledge that i have of how many of these birds are actually illegally taken out of the wild being mixed in with the with the the legal trade, which is uh, birds which are bred within captivity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I think you're you're right, um, and this is a problem in general with the exotic pet trade. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of animals that simply can't be bred very readily or at all in in captivity, and uh, 
you know, a, a, you know, a, a, an organization will pop up and say, okay, we're a breeding facility for X and, and, uh, you know, maybe they can produce some, but, you know, not nearly what's needed for the, for the market. And so they basically use their storefront as a, as a, as a sort of shield to, to, to launder these animals into the, into the trade. Um, you know, they, in some cases they can demonstrate, yeah, yeah, we're doing some breeding here, but, you know, obviously, you know, you, you, the parrots are one of these long lived, um, very highly intelligent, uh, require a lot of space. Um, their courtship rituals are frequently uh, complicated and and sophisticated. So so they, it can they, you know these are not animals necessarily that are made to supply us with with um, our playthings. Um, so 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 you know it's it's interesting in the reading I was doing for this chapter. It's uh, you know very very frequently there are scientists out there who would you know, just studying you know, the behavioral ecology of these parrots, right? They're out in the forest doing, and, and it just, just the n- number of incidents where, where these wildlife biologists out there just kind of watching, you know, at random, you know, watching a, a, a population of parrots and, 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 and poaching would happen right there and then during the study wow. period. You know, it's, That's it's how like frequent just, it is. It, yeah, exactly. It's just, a, it's staggering. Mm. And I, and I think that, that speaks to one of the main uh, as the main things that we can do as pet owners of uh, slightly more unusual pets like like parrots or particularly actually like you were saying particularly with birds and birds of any type is make sure you really know where the source of these birds are and and spend the time and, and effort and go the extra mile to be absolutely certain that you understand that it's coming from a, a recognized and legal source because it's all too easy for you as an individual to contribute and perpetuate this illegal trade which is causing the extinction of these species in the wild. Yeah, it, it, that's that's absolutely right and there, and 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 importantly Resisting the urge, which is common in, in, in the exotic pet world, uh, from my understanding, it, you know, resisting the urge to, to want to have the rare thing. You know, there is a real, there is a real, <clears throat> you know, sense out there, you know, in the exotic pet world where, you know, exotic pet people are talking to other exotic pet people and they say, oh, yeah, but I've got the X, right? And then the, you know, it's a, and they're, and it's like trading cards or whatever yeah, like, you know yeah, like but, trading like rare yeah. baseball cards yeah, yeah yeah so 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 you know you really have to resist that urge because invariably if the animal is 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 rare in the pet trade it's likely rare in the wild and and very likely that the the source of that creature uh, is 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 not on the up and up as 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 readily as it would be. And the reason it's rare is because it probably doesn't breed very successfully in captivity. So 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 you know that's one thing to be particularly aware of. But it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I think that you know if we could get pet owners together, you know, exotic pet owners in particular, and you know sort of make demands of the industry that we track more carefully where these, these animals are coming from. You know, the bottom line is it, it, it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do as an individual. I mean, you can, you can go to PetSmart or one of these large chains and they'll say, yeah, well, we got it from, you know, it's all, it's all on the up and up. And, but, you know, somewhere down the line, you know, if, if people aren't, uh, you know, m- auditing or monitoring, it's 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 pretty difficult. So if we had a, some kind of eco label process that had that had a you know auditing processes in in place to to make sure that this is you know that this uh, sort of more nefarious business is is being cut out of the chain, then that would be you know a tremendous help. And I think pet owners uh, can make you know can begin to insist on that kind of process. Um, 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 you know, if it, it, only, it only takes, um, a, a, you know, it just it just takes some inclination, some sort of showing of interest that that will inspire some small uh, company to go. Okay, yeah, we could we could take that part of the market, the part of the market that's concerned about this thing. We could we could do that by by showing that we have this sort of auditing process. And as soon as that happens, and 
and the bigger companies start to see that they're losing this little tiny piece of the market where that you know that they could gain back very readily then then you know it starts to gather there's a snowball effect and and i think that's how these these um equal label uh systems have been successful in the past you know there'll be some resistance but but as soon as people start to see that they're losing a bit of the market the 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 companies will come around mm. yeah and it is true as as we sort of brought uh, draw this conversation to a close it is true that we're living in a time where people are increasingly aware of our impact which is kind of how how we started this conversation and i i think that there is uh, an element of this where maybe uh, maybe people just didn't have the information at hand to really think deeply about their pet ownership and its impact whether that be cats or whether that be at the other end of the spectrum you know exotic parrots uh, as to really what it what are you doing to those animals and the environment around you by owning them, and people do care. I, I think that, and this this kind of goes back to what you were. Uh, this kind of goes back to the conversation that we started with: is that pet ownership is a function of caring for wild animals, and this is our way of expressing that. And I think with the right knowledge as to the the impacts that we're having through our ownership. You know, be that by extracting animals from the wild, or uh, the impact of our our pets on the environment around them. I think you're right. I think people do want to do the right thing, and and that is the sort of the optimistic outcome from what could can be quite a pessimistic conversation. <laughs> yeah, and I and and thank you for for emphasizing that because that was you know that's my you know that was the hope. Uh, behind the book. I, I I wasn't here to wag my finger at pet owners. I, I am a pet owner. I love being a pet owner. I think it's important, and you spoke to this earlier, I think this emotional connection is is part of what makes us human. It It, it is essential to us. It is, it can't be discounted for some you know, um, mere scientific, oh, our pets are a disaster for the environment, so therefore let's not have pets. No, I, I, I think we need to find a middle ground I'm, maybe I'm Pollyanna-ish in this, but I, I think that pet owners have the power and the interest and the love of animals uh, to, 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 to truly make a difference if they knew. As you say, I had no idea. And when I began this project, um, you know, I am, I've always been a pet owner. I've had turtles, lizards, you know, snakes, squirrels. You know, it, it's, it, these, are, these are things I, I, I valued every, you know, interaction every experience with these animals it's it's been absolutely fascinating and a huge part of my understanding of the world around me and i think that other pet owners would see the same thing if they only knew so i think it's just a question of saying to people okay here's here's what we have uh, we have all of these impacts uh in the pet industry you guys are pouring billions, hundred, you know, more than you know, 120 billion at this point uh, dollars into, into, into uh, the, the pet industry. That, that is, that is, you know, more than the GDP of, of, of all but the sort of 60 richest countries, you know, that, that these are, these are, these are, these are staggering figures, right? And, and, and so, so we, uh, you know, we can make a big difference uh, just as pet owners, just by insisting that we do things a little bit differently. Um, that means personally, in terms of our care of our own animals, uh, but keeping, you know, trying to, to, to try to understand that, yes, they are part of the ecosystem uh, insofar as when they go out in, into the wild, they're making a difference. And we need to be monitoring that and understanding that and the interactions that go on there in terms of what, what they're uh, preying on, but also in terms of what we're feeding them, all those kinds of things. They are part of the world. We are part of the world. Um, but also to insist that the pet industry be more responsive and not just simply kowtowing to, to the demand that, you know, that pet owners, you know, most of us just unaware of these impacts, um, just, you know, wanting more and more and more for, for, for ourselves and for our pets. Peter, thank you very much for bringing this book to the world. 
I, I think as you were just wrapping up there, I was just thinking to myself, what the, what we should insist is that this book is on the shelves of all the pet shops. <laughs> so when people go in, they could uh, they, they they should be see this in front of them and pick this up um, before they go and buy the new pet, or or if they already own a pet, while well, they're buying their their food to feed their pet, is also pick up a, a copy of Unnatural Companions <laughs> so they can educate themselves a little bit more. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation with you today, and. Uh, I, it, I know for a fact that it's going to be one that comes up again in other conversations that I have with people um, in in future podcasts, and I will be sure to um, you know highlight some of the information that you've managed to present you know within this book. And who knows, maybe we will see in the next couple of years a move towards some mechanism of funding through the pet industry wouldn't that be a marvelous thing uh it's definitely not going to be the last time i bring that up and i think if enough people talk about it and if you can get some of the major organizations on side you know i'm thinking like in the uk the rspb would be a brilliant ally for that because i think most of their their um membership are probably cat owners as well uh so and, it would seem. <laughs> yeah, so it would certainly seem. Then we could get uh, you know some really meaningful amounts of money into conservation from you know, a very enthusiastic and loving you know, cohort of society who who enjoy having pets. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Thanks very much for your time, Peter. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much for listening. Tune in next week when we take another walk into the wilderness.